you to go. Father God, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy, especially this week in our lives and raising us back up, Lord. And uh, I just ask, Father, that your anointing would flow through our lips from your heart, from the throne room of heaven. I believe, Lord, this message is for now, for today. And uh, I just pray, God, for your grace <coughs> that it would come upon us this morning and that you would fuel our hearts with your word. In Christ's name, amen. 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 I really did battle over the title. I, I had a couple of titles for this message, and then I decided on this title, Fearful for Our Children. Fearful for our children. The target of the enemy is our posterity. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 6 says this, And he <coughs> shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now we have two choices. We have a choice to be cursed, or we have a choice to be blessed. And I truly believe that God wants to bless and he wants to reconcile parents with children. No matter how disdained and how divided that might be at this moment, but I truly believe that God wants to bring the hearts of children back to their fathers and fathers back to their children and mothers, of course, too. This is both. So I, I want to begin by saying this. You know, I was watching a football game the other day, and there's, I don't know, probably 70,000, 80,000 people. And they were going crazy. I mean, they were cheering, and they were just happy, and so on. And I thought about the angels in heaven. And I said, wow. I said, man, what a celebration. And the, and the verses came to me. It said in Luke 15 and 10, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Wow, the angels like celebrate. Yeah, great job. And then I went to Matthew 25, and the Lord brought this verse to me, verse 21. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So I said, Okay, I see something here. You see, the time between someone accepts the Lord. And the time that we hear those words, good and faithful servant, it's the in-between time. It's the time that we live out that life that we're proclaiming that we've accepted Christ. You understand that? Everybody understand what I just said? It's the in-between time that counts. It's the in-between time of living. And when we talk about repentance, it's not a one-time deal. But it goes throughout our whole entire life, staying pure before God. So I went to some verses about children. Proverbs 4.1 says, Hear ye children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. Proverbs 5.7 says, Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Proverbs 7.24, Hearken unto me now, therefore, O you children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Proverbs 8.32, Now therefore hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. Proverbs 17 and 6 says, Children's children, grandfathers, are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. Proverbs 20 and 7 says, The just man walketh in his integrity, his children are blessed after him. Notice, the just man walks in his integrity, and what's the follow-up? His children are blessed after him. <coughs> Proverbs 31, 28, his chil her children, this is moms, her children ar arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. So what are you saying here? My sermon title is Fearful for Our Children. So what do we have to do? We have to look at this world right now that we're living in. Matthew 19 and 13 tells us this. He says, Then were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. 
We must bring our children to Jesus. Yeah. Now follow. Mark chapter 10 verse 13 says this. And they brought. What is that? That's an active. That's a verb. And they brought young children to him. That he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. You know, there's something when God touches the heart of a child. It's like kindling a fire. It's like there's, there's wood in, in that heart. And the Lord comes and lights that spark, and that kindling begins to take place. And when a child accepts the Lord and the child becomes a, a, a child of God through Christ and through the blood of Christ, there's something that kindles in that heart. It, it promotes a desire, promotes a hunger, and it promotes a thirst for God. Yeah. And we see that we're missing that in society today. Because you don't see that hunger and you don't see that thirst and you, you don't see that thriving toward God. Because God wants to do that. And unless we bring our children to Christ, okay, that will never happen. So, God gave me these verses, and these were the first verses he gave me on Monday. It was found in Job chapter 1 and verse 1 through 5. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. So Job was living the life. Job was living the life. You couldn't be found guilty of not living for God. Because the Bible explicitly tells us this man was perfect, mature, upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she asses, and a great household, a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all men of the East. Evidently a very wealthy, rich man. Evidently had huge amount of flock and a huge amount of servants. Listen to the verse 4. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent, listen carefully, and sanctified them, rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be, it may be, that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, and thus did Job continually. I want to take a moment. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. And I want to read some quotes I want to glean from Matthew Henry's commentary concerning these verses, concerning the children of Job. I'm going to try to glean from this. Matthew Henry says they kept a circular feast at certain times. We don't know if it was birthdays, some kind of celebrations, but they did this in their households. And the brothers and the sisters got together to celebrate, whether it was a birthday, a feast, or whatever it was. But it was a joyous occasion. And Matthew Henry says it was a circular feast at certain times. Okay? And then it says, he says, And Job was happy to see that his children were grown and settled in their, in their world. The olive plants that used to be at his table, around his table, were now removed to their own tables because they were married. He saw them thrive. He saw them feast uh, with one another. He saw them in health. He saw them no sickness in their own houses and so on and so forth. And he saw that they lived in love. They lived in unity. They had mutual good affection. No quarrels, no strangeness, no shyness one of another. No straight handedness. But though everyone knew his own, they lived as much freedom as if they had all in common. Their, their souls were knit together as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Matthew Henry adds this. He says, These brothers were so kind to their sisters that they sent for them to feast with them during these celebrations. For they were so modest that they would not have gone if they had not been sent for. These brothers, those 
brothers, and he says this, and I thought this was very interesting. Those brothers that slight their sisters care not for their company and have no concern for their comfort are ill-bred, ill-natured, and very unlikely Job's sons. It seems their feast was so sober and decent that their sisters were good company for them at it. Unity. Family. What's happened to our country in America? What's happened to our homes? What's happened to Christian homes? And so on and so forth. They feasted in their own homes, not in public houses. They feasted in their own homes. They weren't down at the bar. They weren't down at some nightclub or so on and so forth and so on. Job's concern, though, was for the welfare of his children spiritually. He was jealous over them with a godly jealousy. And he says, it may be that my sons have sinned in the days of their feasting more than any other times. And so I want to get back to the sermon here. Job's children were doing well. He set them all up. They were all doing well. He was a very rich, wealthy man. And the Bible says they feasted. They had celebrations. They had family sibling unity. Matthew Henry, concise commentary, says this. While Job beheld the harmony and comforts of his sons with satisfaction... His knowledge of the human heart made him fearful for them. Mm -hmm. It's very important. He sent and sanctified them, reminding them, listen to what he says, to examine themselves, to confess their sins, to seek forgiveness, and as one who hoped for acceptance with God through the promised Savior, he offered a burnt offering for each one of them. Wow. Wow. We perceive his care for their souls, his knowledge of the sinful state of man, his entire dependence on God's mercy in the way he, he had appointed. So what's, what's Job saying here? What's the, what's the commentary saying here? Job knew that the heart of man was deceitful. And Job wanted to cover or make sure that his sons were safe spiritually. He sanctified them. After they got done with their feast, he called them and he separated them. And not only did he do that, but that separation really implies quiet moments of discussion. We don't have that anymore. We have text messaging. We have phones. We don't, we don't talk to each other. Parents and children don't talk like they used to. We don't, we don't sit down and bear our hearts to one another. There, there, there is no really quiet moments of discussion. We talk about nonsense and stupid things and secular things and worldly and mundane things that don't amount to a hill of beans. That's right. And at the end of the day, you feel like you have the flu spiritually. That's right. You feel like there was no edification. There was no encouragement. There was no like, hey, I'm really lifted up and feel like I can walk on water right now because of that conversation. No, you feel like you've got to dig yourself out of a well, out of a hole, because you're down. You're depressed. Because you didn't get what you expected from a conversation. He reminded them to examine themselves. These are learning experiences that we should give to our children. Teachable moments. Teachable moments. Hmm. Confess their sins, he told them. You must repent if you did anything wrong and offered a burnt offering for each one of them. Now, I know we don't slay oxen and bulls and offer those kind of things, but those burnt offerings are our parental prayers. Amen. Parental prayers go a long way. Amen. Listen, I, I preached, my wife and I, we've been in revivals, many revivals. Can't tell you how many times someone said, Do you know why I'm at this altar preacher? You, you know why I'm, I want to accept Jesus? Because my grandmother has been praying for me all of her life, and she's not even on this earth anymore, but I know God's honored her prayers today. Amen. Or my mom. Thank you, Lord. You know why I'm at this altar today, preacher, evangelist? It's because my mother prayed for me, and she's not with us anymore, but her prayers are being answered today. Amen. The prayers of a grandmother, the prayers of a mom, the prayers of a father, the prayers of a mother goes a long way in the kingdom of God. Let's talk about Abraham for a moment. In Genesis 18 and 19, 
He says, God says this, for I know him. Does God know you? Does God know you this morning? For I know him, that he will command his children. Not, not a suggestion. Not if you want to. Not if you feel like it. The Bible says he will command his children. That's authority. That's authority. And his household after him. You, you, you think Abraham was a stupid man? You know why Abraham was blessed like Job? He, he was wealthy beyond riches. Because he understood the kingdom. He understood the rules and the principles of God. And he said, you think this is for only my kids? This is for all of my servants. And we will serve God together. That was Abraham's stand. And he says this. And he says, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. Who's they? His children and his servants. To do what? To do justice and judgment. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great. And because their sin is very grievous. God said, I will go down now. And see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. God was speaking to Abraham on the backdrop of him judging Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. Think about that for a moment. Think about what I just said. God was speaking to Abraham on the backdrop of him personally visiting Sodom and Gomorrah that were going to be judged. Now listen to this quote from Matthew Henry's concise commentary. He says, Consider as a very bright part of Abraham's character and example that he not only prayed with his family, but he was very careful to teach and rule them well. People don't like rules. Kids don't like rules. People don't like rules. Those who expect family blessings must conscientiously teach concerning family duty. Hmm. Abraham did not fill their heads with matters of doubtful dispute. <clears throat> That's what we do today. We talk about stupid stuff. We talk about things that don't even matter. But he taught them to be serious. Serious. This is not a game. This is not joking throughout life. He taught them to be serious and devout in the worship of God and to be honest in their dealings with all men. Oh, how few may such a character be given in our days. How little care is taken by the heads of families to ground those under them in the principles of religion. Now, this verse struck me, and I actually put it in bold to remind myself of what it said. Do we watch from Sabbath to Sabbath whether they go forward or backward? You might not have understood what I just said here. Matthew Henry commentary. Do we look at our children from Sunday to Sunday and say, have you gone forward or have you gone back? It's called examination. It's called examining your children and getting into a spiritual conversation because it's our parental duty and responsibility by God. Listen to what it says in Deuteronomy 4 9. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, hmm, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them, teach them to your children and your grandchildren. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel. This is God speaking. The Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words, which I command thee this day, command, shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. 
and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou rousest up. What? You mean to tell me that we still have a responsibility to transmit spiritual principles to our children? Yes, we do. And to our grandchildren. Amen. You see, this whole thing is about children. This whole thing is about, and you'll see here in a few moments why I'm preaching the way I'm preaching. And you'll understand it better. This whole thing is about us coming to God and to Christ. Children should ask questions. Why do you say that? Well, I, I looked and I said, why should children ask questions? They should ask questions about God and what he has done. When, when's the last time a kid asked a parent a question about God? I mean, seriously. When's the last time he said, hey, 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 Dad, I, I need to talk to you. I, I, want, I, I want to understand things. Well, let's see what it says in the Old Testament. In, in Exodus 12, 26, it says, And it shall come to pass, when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That you shall say, It's the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of, of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses, and the people bowed their head and worshipped. Children wanted to know, why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we doing the Passover? And the dads explained. Exodus 13 and 14 says, And it shall be when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What is this that thou shalt say unto him, By the strength of the hand of the Lord brought us out of, out of Egypt from the house of bondage. What does that mean? Dad, what happened? How did the Red Sea open? What happened there? And so on and so forth. Children asking spiritual questions. Amen. Not how to play Pokemon. <coughs> Not how to play PlayStation. That has its place. <coughs> but I want to talk to you about a backdrop here for a moment. Deuteronomy 6.20 says, And when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What means these testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out, out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Spiritual conversation must be aroused in the last days. Yeah. Listen, if you can't see that we're living in end times, you're living under a rock somewhere. Yeah, sure, sure. Really. The secular world is losing their minds. <clears throat> because the secular world is saying there's something different going on. This is just not normal. Normal. You, you got Ukraine blowing up military insta installations in Russia. That's right. You got North Korea supplying soldiers. Well, what's happening here? The UN is sending soldiers. Well, what's happening here? And we're talking about mundane, worldly, stupid things that don't amount to a hill of beans while our children are in a spiritual drought. Okay. You with me so far? Spiritual conversation. You see, these are exciting times for Christians and for our families to discuss the imminent signs of Jesus coming. Now, I set you up, the Lord did, to bring you to this point. Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 1. And these were the, the devotions that were put up a few days later after I got these verses from the Lord. And I felt like, I have to preach this sermon. This is God speaking. This is the backdrop. Now you may disagree with me or not. I don't know when God is going to totally judge America. Neither do you. But you have to at least admit your, to yourself this. That judgment could possibly be eminent. We can't keep doing what we're doing to children and expect to escape without blemish. It's just not in the book. 
We cannot shed innocent blood. We cannot mutilate children. We cannot put a blind eye to human trafficking. We can't. It can't. No matter what your political place is in the world, our spiritual place is to look at reality and say, God, I don't know when or how, but I do know this. That if you judge the people in the Old Testament for what they did, and you don't judge us for what we're doing, then there's a two-tiered justice system that God has, and I know that's not true. That's right. Yeah. That's right. You see, God commanded Abraham to teach his children justice and judgment. Amen. About the righteousness and the right thing before God. So I go to Ezekiel 14 and 1. I'm saying, well, why am I here? Now, some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me. I have to read a few verses to you to explain. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Should I let myself be inquired of, of at all by them? Question. Therefore, speak to them and say to them, Thus saith the Lord God. Now God's speaking. These are the elders. These are the spiritual people. These are the people in the city gate. And they're coming to the prophet. Therefore speak to them. Thus saith the Lord. Every one of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity and then comes to the prophet, I the Lord will answer him who comes according to the multitude of his idols. Okay? That I may seize the house of Israel by their heart because they are all estranged from me by their idols. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord your God, repent, turn away from your idols, and turn your faces away from all your abominations. For anyone of the house of Israel or the strangers who dwell in Israel who separates himself from me and sets up idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity, then comes to the prophet to inquire of me, of, of concerning me, I the Lord will answer him by myself. Now God's going to reply in verse 8. I will set my face against that man and make him sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet is induced to speak anything, I, the Lord, have induced that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and destroy him from among my people Israel. And they shall bear their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be the same as the punishment of the one who inquired, that the house of Israel may no longer stray from me, nor be profaned anymore with all their transgressions, but that they may be their God, says the Lord. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, Son of man, when a land sins, now listen, when a land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off its supply of bread, send famine, cut off man and beast from it. Even these three men, and this is what I said, this is what the Lord wanted me to see. And even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. What does all that mean? Do you not think that we're, as a country, not transgressing against God? Can any of us sit here this morning and think that people aren't worshiping their idols? Can, can, can we really look at the Bible and, and say, uh, God's not going to judge America. We're just too great. We're, we're, we're the best, man. We, we, we're good to go. Can, can we really see here as Christians? Hearing some of this political nonsense, that's insane. Totally insane. Can we digest that and say, if it's, it's okay. It's not. And so on the backdrop of this, where does that leave our children? Who don't know Christ. Listen, people got mad at me many years ago. I had a much larger church here. 
And I asked the question, are your kids really saved? My parents, what are you talking about? They come to church. They don't mean nothing. That's right. Because I sit in a car, it doesn't make me a car. Because I sit in a car, it doesn't make me a car. Because I sit in a church, it doesn't make me a Christian. People got offended. Parents got offended. National Sins. Commentary. By Matthew Henry again. National sins bring national judgments. Mm -hmm. The rain falls upon the just and the unjust. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's very true. And I don't know where we're going to fall in between all that stuff. Amen. But I have to believe that God, who judged Sodom and Gomorrah, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah if we don't eventually get judged in America. Think about it. It's out there. It's, it's just out there. It's not in a closet anymore. It's out there. It's debauchery. It's in our streets. And they're proclaiming this. We're coming for your children. The audacity. We're coming for your kids. Really? And how long is God going to put up with that? Those sinners escape one judgment. And what Matthew Henry is saying, there might come one judgment upon America. And we might be good to go for a while. Okay? But what happens when multiple judgments come upon America? Let me, I'll get to that in a moment. When God's professing people rebel against him, <laughs> professing people, they may justly expect all his judgments. The faith, obedience, and prayers of Noah prevailed to the saving of his house, but not of the old world. That's right. Job's sacrifice and prayer on behalf of his friends were accepted, and Daniel had prevailed for those Saving companions and wise men of Babylon, but not everybody. There was only certain people that accepted the ways of God. Listen. Job's children experienced a calamity. A great wind came while they were in a house and collapsed the house and they all died. Now you understand why Job did what he did? Why he called them to his side after the celebrations? Why he examined them? Why he told them to separate and be sanctified? Why he told them to confess their sins? He said, well, my children are perfect. Okay, let me give you an example. This is just an example. I've got a room full of kids. All of a sudden, one kid ends up crying, crying, coming out, tears. And you ask a silly question. Can you tell me what happened? You're calling the FBI, the CIA. You individually interrogate each one kid, and you get five or six different stories. Or you get this. A lie. Children lie. I didn't do it. I, I didn't do anything. You see this? Convincing, isn't it? I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. You're lying. How do we deal with that? <clears throat> on the backdrop of what's happening in our country, on the backdrop of bring our children to Jesus, have spiritual conversation, correction, commandments, statutes, rules, regulations, and showing children the penalty of sin, because we don't want to disturb children's psyche anymore. 
That's right. well, we don't want to upset their minds. We, we don't want to do any of that anymore. So we just let them go. We let them drink the cup of poison from the world. It's true. And die and go to hell. And then live with regrets. Listen, this is not easy preaching on Sunday morning. But this is a warning. These are warnings that God is trying to speak. Amen. Don't take things for granted. Jeremiah, the, the, the Barnes note says this, Noah did not rescue the guilty world, but did carry forth with, his, with him his wife's sons and son's wives. Daniel raised only a few, but he did raise three of his countrymen, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to Job was spared neither son nor daughter. I'm assuming that the ten children of Job were spiritually sound because of what their father did in their lives. Not taking for granted their spiritual lives but sitting down with them and saying, listen, I want to talk to you one by one. I want to know what's going on. Well, are parents doing that? Are we doing that with electronics? Do we even know what our kids are looking at? Do we even know what they're listening to? No, we don't. Because the enemy's got us so busy. So involved. And under our own roof, our children are doing things that they shouldn't be doing, doing and they know it. When a child can't look you in the eyes, there's something wrong. When a child shies away from you because they know what you stand for, there's something wrong. Now you might get mad at me, that's okay. I'm here to tell you that judgment is coming eventually. And we need to get our families in the boat for sure. And we need to know do you know Jesus Christ and are you living for God? Is that a bad question? No. Is that a wrong assumption? No. Because Jeremiah said this in his day when he was prophesying about judgment. He said in Jeremiah 15 and 1, Thus saith the Lord unto me, Though Moses and Samuel, two great prophets, stood before me, yet my mind could not be toward this people, cast them out of my sight, and then let go forth. He's saying, listen, even if Daniel, Job, and Noah, and Moses and Samuel lived in this day and they prayed all the prayers they wanted to pray, it still doesn't mean that your sons and daughters would be saved because I would save them. Unless your sons and daughters came to Christ and they were saved of their own. You see, all we can do as parents is influence. All we can do is inspire. That's all we can do. And children have to make choices, but we have to have that spiritual conversation. Because Ezekiel went on to say in Ezekiel 14 and 15, he said this, If I cause wild beasts to pass through the land and they empty it, and make it so desolate that no man may pass through because of the beasts, even though these three men were in it, three men, Noah, Job, Daniel, as I live, says the Lord, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, only they would be delivered and the land would be desolate. Or if I bring a sword on that land and say, sword, go through the land, and I cut off man and beast from it, even though these three were in it as I live, says the Lord, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, but only themselves would be delivered. Or if I send a pestilence into the land and pour out my fury out in blood and cut off it from man and beast, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. For thus says the Lord, How much more, how much more it shall be when I send my four severe judgments on Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, the wild beasts, and the pestilence, to cut off man and beast from it. Doesn't that break your heart? In the first 14 verses, he talked about one judgment. He said, 
what's going to happen if I send four? What's going to happen? Though you might be righteous, and you might be righteous, and you might be righteous, it doesn't mean your sons and daughters are going to make it. Does that alarm anybody here in this building? Yeah. Yeah. Does that not get your attention? Just because we come to church doesn't mean anything. It's knowing Christ really. Amen. It's following Jesus. Yes, amen. In the NLT version, that 21st verse of Ezekiel 14 says this. Now, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. How terrible it will be when all four of these dreadful punishments fall upon Jerusalem. What happens if it falls on the United States of America? Famine, wild animals, disease, destroying all her people and animals. You think that's not possible? He said, Pastor, I, I didn't really come to hear this today. No, we, we need to hear this. That's right. Because people are living in La Land thinking, yeah. I got everything I need. I got a car, I got a house, I, I got, I got everything. What, what, what am I worried about? What do I got to pray for? Well, what do I need to talk to my kids about? They go to church. Gil's commentary says, if the Lord would not be entreated by such good men as those mentioned, for a land that sinned against him, to whom he only sent some one of the above judgments, either famine, noisome beasts, or sword, or pestilence, how much more, how much greater will be the destruction when he sends four judgments against Jerusalem or against our country? We have people here in America dreaming that that could never happen to America. Yeah. I wish to God that it would never would happen to America. Really. <coughs> no one wants to see judgment. No one wants to see devastation. Look at the devastation we saw in Florida. Yeah. Look at the devastation in North Carolina. Those, those people are just, they, they, they've been devastated. Yeah. <coughs> I saw a lady Picking through her belongings. She said, I, I don't even have a picture. I, I don't even have a memory. <coughs> it's all gone. It's all gone. Think about it. Those are hurricanes, floods, tornadoes. Imagine if God unleashed his wrath Oh, the church doors would be open and, and the church would be full. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. then we'd have a need. Yeah. Then we'd come to a prayer meeting. Then we'd make sure that our schedule has God at the top. Yeah. <laughs> you see, these things happen. Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 7 says, The lion has come up, up from his thicket and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He's gone from his place to make the land desolate and the city shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. You see, the Assyrians came, then Nebuchadnezzar came, and the people, the Bible says, Babylon has, has broken his bones. The judgments came upon Jerusalem. They were de devastated. But here's the good news. Not that what I've given you isn't good news. <coughs> here's the good news. And here's what the Lord said in the 22nd verse of Ezekiel 14. He says, yet behold, God was saying, I want you to stop for a minute. I've given you a lot, Ezekiel. I know this is a lot for you to process and tell the people. These people that came to the prophets and they want a word and the prophets are serving idols, they're false. And that's what's happening here in America. We have a lot of people prophesying, but not really saying, let's say the Lord, just dream, visions, and everything's going to be good, blah, blah, blah. 
God said, I'll, I'll judge the prophets and I'll put the lion in their mouth and tell the people right. the word they want to hear. That's what that word says. And if you, if you look at the first verses of Ezekiel 14. But then God says, yet behold. He says, stop. Sit down. There shall be left in it. Where? In Jerusalem. A remnant who will be brought out both sons and daughters. This is my hope. As a father, as a grandfather, as a father of the church spiritually. That our sons and our daughters, our children of this church, listen carefully, will be brought out, both your sons and daughters, surely they will come out to you and you will see their ways and their doings. Then you will be comforted, comforted concerning the disaster I have brought upon Jerusalem, all that I have brought upon it. And they will comfort you, who? The children. When you see their ways and their doings, and you shall know that I have done nothing without cause that I have done in it, says the Lord. What's he saying? Yes, I'm going to judge Jerusalem. But tell the people, Ezekiel, there'll be a group of people. God's always had a group. He's always had a remnant. He showed that in the days of Genesis, the book of Genesis, Noah, in the boat. He always had a group of people. And he will have a people that will come out. No matter what happens to America, no matter what the devastation may be in the future, the comfort that I have this morning is this. He says, there shall be left in it a remnant. That's us. That's our posterity. That's what Malachi was talking about. That the hearts of the children must return back to the hearts of the fathers. Lest the curse come upon the earth. We must rescue. We must speak. We must sit down and be honest. And we must command our children to do justice and judgment and exhort them to live a spiritual life. So let me close with this. And I want to go back to Job. Now you all know the story of Job. I don't have to go into that. I want to close. Job lost ten children. He had a wife that was really cranky. Really. She said, why don't you just curse God and die? And Job, you know, he was, he went through a lot. And he had no idea why, because God never told him. There was a conversation between Satan and God. And Satan said to God, just pull the hedge from him. I, I bet he'll turn on you. And God said, no, he won't. And God took the hedge away from him, the protection. And all these things happened to Job. He lost everything. His wealth, his cattle, his houses, his kids. But somehow, God showed mercy. And we don't know if it was the wife that he already had because he doesn't mention another wife. But Job lived another 140 years and had 10 children. See, he lost 10, but God gave him back 10. Think about that for a moment. So when you explore this, the Bible says in Job 42 and 13, he also had seven sons and three daughters. I really find, find it almost mystical that the wife that cursed him, Job loved so much that they can see ten more children. That's love, man. When a wife turns on you for a moment, and I understand she was under pressure. I get it. I'm not blaming her. I, I, hey, here's a man sitting on an ash heap, and he's got a, a stone, and he's cutting boils to, to get some relief, and, and maybe she said it out of mercy. Why don't you just curse God and die? We don't. Why, why are we doing this? And sometimes people say, well, why are we doing this? Well, we must be crazy. Why are we preaching? Why are we doing this? 
because God's commanded us to do it. So listen, here's the good part for me and for hopefully for you. There's going to be a remnant. It's up to us to develop that remnant and have a talk with our kids. We need to have a spiritual talk with our kids. Hear what I'm saying? And he called the name of the first Jemima and the name of the second Ke Keziah and the name of the third Karen Hapak and all in the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job and their father gave them an inheritance among their brethren. So now Job has three daughters. Must be the apple of his eye. He had seven sons which I know were very important to Job as any dad. Sons would be important. And after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. These are grandchildren. So Job died being old and full of days. Now, let me leave you with this. Because I believe there's a message here. The, day, the names of the three daughters. Give comfort. In the chaos and confusion that we're living in right now, in the insanity that we are viewing, day by day, I said, okay, let's explore. I love words. I love names in the Bible. What do they mean? Jemima means day by day. Basically means go one day at a time. You can't bite off tomorrow until you chew up today. It means daytime, light, after a dark night. You've heard that verse, weeping endureth for a night, but joy comes in the morning. It means growing lighter and lighter until the full day sunshine. It means a clear day. It means a dove signifying peace and comfort. And it also means to show signs of excitement. We're living in the most exciting moment in church history. Because at any moment, at any moment, nothing needs to be fulfilled. In the moment of a twinkling of an eye, we could be gone. Amen. Think about that. From a chair to heaven. Amen. Think about it. Like that. You can't blink that fast. So God is saying to me, so I'm taking one day at a time. And there will be dark moments. But I will give light. And you will see at the end of the tunnel the light that comes forth. It says in Psalm 29 and 11, The Lord will give strength unto his people, and the Lord will bless his people with peace. That's the dove. Jude 2 says, Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Psalm 23 and 4, familiar verse. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Amen. So the first girl, her name brings peace, light. Keziah means casea. It means bark that's peeled off of a tree. It means to strip or to segregate that from the tree. It's an evergreen tree having aromatic bark that uses it as a substitute for cinnamon. That's right. This name means fresh smell. It also means a breath of fresh air, anointing oil. So now you have the second sister. And God is saying, listen, I'm going to give you a breath of fresh air. And I know there's times when we go through really hard moments. We go through times of sorrow and despair, and we think we're never going to come out of those moments. And sometimes we get sick, like we lived this week. This is the first time I've been out of the house in a week. This is Tuesday. But God says, I want to bring you fresh air, a breath of fresh air. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 27, but the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. What's the anointing? It's that unction. It's that ointment that God prepared for the Jewish people, the oil, the aromatic oh, herbs that they put on themselves. The anointing oil of God. And God is saying, I not only want to give you day by day light, 
I not only want to give you a fresh smell and a breath of fresh air and the anointing oil so that you can go through this world of chaos and insanity. And then he gives us the name of the last daughter, Karen Hapak. It means horn of an antimony. A-N-T-I-M-O-N-Y. I don't have time to go into this. I never heard that word before. But I did a search on it. You can't believe how valuable this is toward lithium. This is crazy stuff. You can't believe how valuable this is. This word, her name means I cosmetic. That's where we get cosmetics from. And what does it mean? It means to paint, to paint the face to wipe away tears. It means fair colors. It means to glisten or shine. It's a ray of light, a peak of a mountain signifying he will lead us where we need to be. What are you saying? Well, why, why do we put makeup on? To brighten. To bring joy to other people. To look nice. And when they walk in the room, you're, you, wow, that, that's beauty. That's beauty. Not that drab look and whatever. I'm not saying we should paint our faces like, you know, Tammy Faye Baker, you know. <laughs> that was a little absorbent. <coughs> God bless her. Great singer. Great heart. You hear what the Lord's saying here? I have hope, like I preached last week in the Lord. No matter what happens, the most important thing that can happen is our posterity. Our brothers, our sisters, our loved ones, our sons, our daughters, our grandchildren are prepared spiritually to be in the ark of safety so that no matter what happens, praise God, hallelujah, God will lead us day by day and hallelujah, he will share us the anointing oil of God and he will cause us to shine like the noonday sun because he loves us and he will bring us out from all of this judgment and all of this ruckus and he will find us as the remnant church. Isaiah said in Isaiah 16 and 1, Arise and shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Isaiah 25 and 8 says this, Yes, he'll banish death forever, and God will wipe the tears from every face. He'll remove every sign of disgrace from his people, wherever they are. Yes, God says so. His daughter's name reminded Job, of God's great goodness toward him. Think about all he went through. And God blessed him a hundredfold more than in the beginning. Because Job was a righteous man. Now you listen to me. I want to close. We can't possibly save our sons and daughters by ourselves because we didn't die on the cross. The best we can do is inspire them and incline them toward Christ. But you hear this. Job was a righteous man. And if we think that our sons and daughters are going to accept Christ if we're not living for God, we're fooling ourselves. We drink the cup of deception. You can't be doing worldly things and then tell your kid, don't do what I do. No. That's not teaching children the right thing. You see, because what's going to happen in the last day? Children will rise up in our faces and say, you are a hypocrite. You are a hypocrite. Okay, how much you go to church? I don't care how much you read your Bible. I don't care how much you do this or do that. You're a hypocrite. Because I hear you. And I see you. And I observe you. And I live with you. And you don't do right by God. You know, sometimes a parent has to get down before his kids and say, I'm sorry. Yeah. I blew it. And parents will. Yeah. We're not perfect. Yeah. I know I've done things that Maybe I shouldn't have done as a parent. Said things maybe at times. Whether it was an excuse of anger or tiredness or whatever. 
Not perfect. But there comes a time when you have to say, God, forgive me. Even if that person doesn't, even if a son or daughter doesn't forgive. Clear before him. You see, Job was reminded when he had these ten children and these three girls. He says in Psalm 27 and 13, he said, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen. Psalm 31 and 19 says, How great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. In Psalm 71, 21, Thou shalt increase my greatness, my comfort, and comfort me on every side. Ladies and gentlemen, I truly believe that the Lord gave me this message today to warn us. We don't know the hour or the day. We don't know when God's going to take this one or that one. We don't. I stand before you humble this morning, and I say that word because I have a dear brother that's dying of cancer. Very dear to us. And I woke up in bed last night and I said, Lord, how have I escaped thus far? I've had cancer. I see people that are younger than me that are dying. And I say, how have I escaped thus far? It's not my goodness. Are you hear what I'm saying? Amen. It's the mercy and the goodness of God. Amen. I can't figure it out. I can't understand it. Why God takes one and leaves another? All I do is to love the best I know how. To be generous, to give the best I know how. To open my heart the best I know how. Whether it's received or rejected. Just keep on trying. And as a parent, and I'll speak as a dad and as a grandfather, to be a role model. So that my boys and girls, well, my grandchildren, yeah. can look at me as a dad, as a grandfather, at their grandma, mm -hmm. and say, I know that grandma and grandpa love God, yeah. and they serve him. Yeah. I'm not a carpenter. I'm not a mechanic. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not rich, I'm not famous. I'm just a preacher. Amen. That God, for some reason, called to preach his gospel. And I just want to bring the messages that he gives me to the Lord, from the Lord to you. I believe this word this morning is important. <coughs> Sit down with your children and make sure, make sure they understand salvation. Make sure they understand repentance. Make sure they understand serving Jesus is the most important thing. Listen, you can become a lot of things in this life and die in that. But if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you'll go to heaven forever. That's what's most important. Would you stand with us? Father, thank you. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the warning. You gave us one last week. We can't just leave this church and go out the door and say, well, that was a good sermon, maybe. Well, we need to hear what thus saith the Lord. What God is saying to us. This is important. Because judgment will eventually come to our country. When? Don't know. Where? Don't know. But it has to come. Because it came in the Old Testament. It's got to come now, Lord, for what we're doing here in our country. I pray for our country this morning. I pray that we would repent and turn away from our evil ways and our idols. And I pray that families would get it together once again. That you would reunite moms and daughters, sons and daughters, 
brothers, siblings, families, once again, Lord, under the banner of love and forgiveness, I pray, Father God, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Remain standing with us.